What's up painting friends? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Stoof and today we're going to do a real-time painting tutorial using oil paint to paint lower Yellowstone Falls. I'm using a 12 inch by 15 inch canvas for this painting. I stretched the canvas myself and then I put a wash on the canvas which means I just really thinned down some oil paint uh, using my citrus solvents and some of my earthy tones like my siennas, umbers, reds, yellows, uh, and like a little, maybe a little bit of blue too and just uh, created that wash that you see on the canvas just to cover up the white. Uh, because the waterfall is the focus on this painting and it's pretty bright, I didn't want to uh, like falsely make things too light or too dark. I wanted to just start with that neutral color for the base of the canvas and then start to build the paint colors on top of that. To get started with this painting, we are using oil paint. Um, the method I'm using here is the grid method where I get my reference photo on my computer screen and then I adjust the size of that photo to fit the same dimensions of this canvas. So I digitally make the file for the photo fit 12 by 15 inch dimensions and then I make sure I add a grid on that reference photo with three inch spacing. So every three inches I'll put a little tick mark on my canvas which are those tiny little dots you see there creating this little grid and then I will match this grid up to the grid on my reference photograph and that helps me to sketch everything out accurately on the first try without making any mistakes. I'm not making the waterfall too big, I'm not making the angles of the rock coming down into this gorge be too steep or too shallow. I'm just getting all of my angles and proportions accurate because I'm looking exactly at the reference photo and matching things up with each little grid from the photo onto the painting. So we're just gonna speed this part up because you guys can tackle this on your own. Now that I explained how I use the grid method, just hit pause if you are working on this as you're watching. And here's a little screenshot of my reference photo. I took this photo myself in Yellowstone and you are welcome to reference this photo for recreational purposes. If you're recreating this painting just to learn or just to make, to keep in your own room, that's fine. I just ask that you never sell a work that you created by copying one of my pieces. <laughs> and that goes for all artists. Don't ever copy someone's work and then try to resell exactly what they did. If you're not using the grid method and you're just eyeballing it, that's fine too. Um, your proportions might just look a little different than what I have here. So once I sketched out the basic features, meaning like the shapes of the big parts of rock that are sticking down into the gorge, the basic shape outline of the waterfall, the horizon line where the sky meets the land, and that rock in the foreground. Then I'm ready to start adding some color for things that are farthest in the background here. So we're going to start by blending some phthalo blue, a hint of phthalo green, and white. And that's going to be my base color for the sky. As you can see, that blue looks a little brighter than what we have in the reference photo right now. So I'll start to add a little bit more phthalo blue and like a hint of ultramarine blue towards the top of the sky as I keep working just to get that color a little bit more true to what I'm seeing in the photo. Maybe brightening things and making them a little bit more vibrant just using my artistic freedom there. Uh, but we're basically just going back and forth. I'm using a medium round tipped brush for this, working my way up into the sky, starting to add a little bit more blue as I start to go further up into the sky towards the top of the canvas, leaving some empty void spaces for now where I'm gonna have some clouds. And then we'll go back later and add those clouds and kind of let them blend slightly into the background color of the sky. This painting tutorial is aimed more towards intermediate level painters. You should have some experience because I don't show you my paint palette while I'm working on this one. So it might be a little tricky for beginners to blend the proper colors. 
Uh, and it also might be a little tricky for beginners to catch on to some of these brushstroke techniques that I'm using here. Uh, but you are welcome to try this no matter what experience level you are with painting. So you can see with this round tip brush, I'm just putting the paint down and then making some back and forth little marks with the brush, trying to get a nice soft blend. That's the most important thing for your sky. You want to have a nice soft blend, especially if you're going for a realistic look. And just going back and forth, lightly pressing, uh, pressing a little bit harder onto the canvas when I want to really push that paint around, and then lightly pressing when I want to get a softer blend uh, will be useful for getting this painting to look more realistic. So I'll put some paint down, blend it back and forth, and then blend into the other colors already on the canvas. Starting to add a little more ultramarine blue and a little bit more phthalo blue at the top here. You can see the sky is making that transition from that lighter, greener blue into the cooler, darker blue at the top of the sky, but not too extreme. There isn't too extreme of a color change. And next we can start to add the cloud colors. So for the clouds, we're starting with the shadowy color first. And to get the shadowy color, we're gonna use titanium white with a hint of ivory black some ultramarine blue, and maybe a hint of burnt umber, and a hint of yellow ochre. You can kind of play around by adding a little bit more umber and ochre. You're going to warm up that shadow by adding a little more ultramarine blue. You're going to cool down that shadow. Having just white and black gives you that neutral color. So play around with the colors. Uh, try to get a good combo that works well for you. Now looking at light to dark value here, the shadow color for the clouds should just be slightly darker than your sky color. And then we'll start to build up more highlights on top of that. So I'm trying to figure out the best shadow tone now. I'm starting to build up just a little bit of highlight here too. Taking a little bit more white and hints of ochre uh, and incorporating that into the cloud just to try to start to show where I'm having some highlights and shadows but without getting into too much detail yet. And you can see I'm still using that medium round tip brush and I'm starting to do little swirls with the brush here and that's helping to build up that cloud texture. Even though we're not going into detail yet, we still need to have the proper brush stroke that can help to make these look like clouds. Here I'm trying to get a little bit of a deeper shadow there. You can see that that shadow there is just a little darker in value than the blue sky behind it. And that's exactly what I was trying to achieve there. Also trying to build a little bit of highlight because the highlight is brighter than the background and that shadow is just a little darker than the background blue. So we're kind of playing around with value still, trying to get everything to match up accurately. And this is where having that wash for the background really comes in handy because if I had just a plain white background, it would be a little bit trickier to get an accurate shadow and highlight value for these clouds because that pure white would be throwing me off a little bit and making everything that I paint appear darker. Now we're moving up to this cloud that's a little closer to the foreground. Nice puffy cloud just rising up into the sky. And I basically starting with that shadow color again. So now as the sky is moving up, the sky is getting darker. So the cloud shadow color isn't as dark as the background sky. So that's something to think about too when you're painting. It makes things a little bit trickier, but always think about your values when you're looking at things. How light and dark should something be in comparison to what is behind it or what's in front of it? And you also need to think that as things move really close to you, they're gonna have a lot more contrast. So if you look at the trees in the reference photo, those green trees right in the bottom in that second grid in from the left and the bottom, those are really dark shadows right there. And if you look at the trees way far back in the background, like in that um, one down from the top right grid, those shadows aren't as dark back there. There's a lot more white in the color there. So just think about that. Whenever you're starting to build your shadows, things that are really far in the background don't have as much black or dark color in them. They have more white and neutral colors in them, uh, whites and blues and purples. And then as you move forward, closer to the foreground, things have way more contrast and more of those reds and yellows in them too. So I kind of went 
off topic there, <laughs> away from the clouds. Let's bring it back to the clouds here. So again, I'm creating that puffy texture here. Uh, still not building up too much detail yet, but I'm kind of dry brushing. I know the paint is all wet still here, but I am trying to take the excess paint off of my brush and just lightly pressing and sweeping in little circle motions to create those little puffy clouds. Just kind of letting it blend slightly into that sky, adding a little bit more color in parts where I want to build it up a bit. Uh, but we are going to keep building up those layers in part two. Uh, but for now, we're definitely getting a good base layer of paint and we're really building up that cloud texture before we start to build up the details. At this point, we're just finishing up the sky, adding some more puffy clouds and completely covering up the brown, seeping through the canvas there, just keeping everything really light and fluffy. And as you might have noticed, the shapes of my clouds aren't exactly like the reference photo. They're pretty close, but they're not 100% accurate to what I have in my photo. And that's okay because this is a landscape painting, so these clouds will still read realistically, even though they're not gonna be exactly 100% exactly like the clouds in the reference photograph. Once we finish getting that base color down for the clouds, we're going to start moving closer to the foreground. And the next thing closest in the foreground to us are those trees around the horizon line there. So the section on the left side here isn't exactly the farthest thing in the background. Um, there's some trees a little farther back on the right. They go farther into the distance. But I wanted to start with this one so I could get a uh, middle tone for that green because I know I'm going to mix in a little bit more white for the green that's farther in the background there. Um, so I just wanted to get this color down first so then I could make the color that would be a little bit farther in the distance for that other one. You could start with the section in the right that's the farthest in the distance and then keep building forward. That's another route you could take. Um, but yeah, for getting your base layer paint down, do whatever's easiest for you for finding the right color value and color warmth and color saturation. First, I just blocked in this color. This color is sap green with white and a little ultramarine blue, a little bit of burnt sienna in there as well. Maybe a little bit of uh, cadmium yellow medium, but not too much yet. Just making like a middle tone here. I'm not really doing a shadow color or a highlight color yet. Just putting a base color down and then starting to add those little ridges for the top parts of the trees that we see over the horizon there. I am going to probably end up covering this up as I start to build more texture with the clouds. But then we can always come back and go over this again and darken these and make them look a little more realistic. To make these little treetop shapes, I'm just using my round tip brush, but a flat tip brush would work fine here too. Uh, you just want to use a finer brush so you can get a little bit more detail here. And you're just holding the brush at an angle so you can get that sharper edge tip. And you just go up and down, creating those little treetops. Just go back and forth, making little up and down motions. I'm starting to build a little bit of the shadows in here but still not going too crazy in detail yet because I know I'm gonna to have to paint over uh, bits of this later. I'm building up a shadow here. This ledge of rock coming down creates a shadow right behind it that is like an ultramarine blue with some burnt umber, maybe some phthalo blue, maybe like a hint of alizarin crimson in there too just to make it a little bit more on the purpley side. And those shadows kind of come up into that tree area too. 
One thing I see a lot with beginner and intermediate artists is that they make their shadows too dark for things that are in the background. So even though my reference photo, those shadows look pretty dark, photos tend to do that. So that's something you can, if you're conscious of, you can make up for in your painting. So in real life, if you were looking at this, those shadows might not look quite as dark as they do in the photograph. Uh, so I'm lightening up those shadows slightly that are in the background, and that's gonna help to build the sense of depth and distance in my painting that isn't quite as visible in the photograph. The photograph slightly flattens out that background. So by making my shadows even less of a dark value, like bringing the value up a little bit in the shadows in the background from what I see in the photograph, I can push those things in the distance even further back into the distance. Uh, and then as we look at it, we're gonna perceive that as super far back in the distance because the shadows and the contrast is even less than what we see in the photo. I'm still using my smaller round tip brush here, starting to create some fuzzy little lines for the hillside here. Things are getting less detailed as we move farther into the distance to the point where we can't even see each individual tree sticking up. The hillside just becomes more of a shape itself, a rounded shape. So as we're moving farther into the distance, we're losing detail. Things are getting more white in them. And I'm continuing to put that base layer of green down for all of the sections behind the waterfall where we have tree coverage. Switching it up between more of a shadow color and a little bit more of a highlight color or a base color. And then later when we go back for part two, we'll start to really add detail adjust the warmth of this green and start to add more individual shadows and highlights to show the each little part of the tree. Now I'm starting to add some base color in for the waterfall and to get that we're starting with some titanium white, a hint of yellow ochre, maybe a little bit of ivory black, and we're just Filling in the whole section of waterfall from edge to edge where I sketched it. Starting to add a little bit of a shadow on the left side and at the base of the waterfall. And then for the misty part at the base of the waterfall there, I just blended in a little bit of ultramarine blue and a little bit more ivory black to my white. And just because there's a little bit of a color difference between the base and the falls, Just using little swirling motions with the brush to get that puffy, almost cloud-like look for the mist coming up from this waterfall. Next, we're moving down to the Yellowstone River, just below the falls. And for this, I'm using a little bit of my phthalo green mixed in there with some sap green and burnt umber, maybe a hint of ochre and a hint of phthalo blue as well. Uh, starting with a really deep shadow 
and then I'm gonna add some white mixing into that later just to brighten it up a little bit. But we do have some deeper shadows along the edges of the river. Here I'm starting to pull that shadowy color from the river up into the rock and continuing that shadow just to the left of the waterfall. The shadow has a little more umber in it, maybe some umber with ultramarine blue to tone down the warmth of that umber, adding a little bit of white in there as well. And then next I'm just going back in the waterfall and starting to add a little bit of subtle color variation, adding a little bit of emerald from the running water. You can see where it's not quite white water at the top of the falls, and then little hints of shadows uh, from the bursts of white water cast a little bit of a shadow on some sections of the waterfall. So I'm just starting to add a little bit of variation there. Not going too detailed yet, but trying to remember where we do have some shadows in the waterfall. Next, we're moving over to the rock face directly to the right of the waterfall. And this color is one that you need to play around with a little bit to get the exact color that makes you happy. Um, but I played around with variations of like primarily using titanium white, adding a little bit of cadmium yellow light, yellow ochre, rose, like a permanent rose color. And then more of my browns, like my burnt sienna and my umber and kind of finding what colors worked best. This is a warmer rock. It's nice and light in the sun there. It's nice and warm. So we don't uh, want to use too many cool colors in that. For the shadows at the base part of this rock, we do have a little bit of the cooler variation. So I did mix more ultramarine blue, um, maybe more of my umber and like a hint of dioxazane purple or something like that, just to uh, cool down the shadow part of that rock. And again, we're using my short bristled flat tip brush just to get that nice sharp edge between the contact point of the rock face and the trees above it. Starting to put that shadow in to the right of the falls. This waterfall kind of shoots out from the rock area, casting a shadow directly to the right of the falls. And then we're continuing to move to the right, getting closer to the viewer. We have uh, more of these rocks kind of coming down in this gorge to the river. And this rock here is a little cooler than that rock behind it. So I'm using a little bit more of my umber, maybe starting to blend a hint of ultramarine blue in, but not using as much cadmium yellow or reds in there. Using my short bristled flat tip brush to get that nice sharp edge. Also using that brush to push around the paint where I'm starting to add some subtle shadows and blend those into my highlight colors. The biggest thing with these rocks is don't use the same level of warmth or coolness for the whole thing. Like you wanna kinda of play around with your colors. Try to use more colors than you think you need and that'll help build the depth in the rocks as well and keep things from looking flat. By building up that shadow in between these two rock layers, I'm helping us to realize that that rock to the right is coming in closer to the viewer and it kind of separates those two sections of rock. It's a little hard to see that these two rocks are separate in the reference photo because first of all the photo flattens the colors a little bit and second there's a grid line right in that section where the rocks separate so we can't quite see it in the reference photo but I know it's there. Now moving even closer to the viewer we're starting to build up more contrast in the rocks so I started with this darker shadow color and then added that highlight color from the rock behind it, maybe adding a little bit more ochre in there too, and then blending those colors, kind of starting to blend up into that shadow color just to tone down the strength of that shadow for my base layer. Because I did make that color a little too dark. <laughs> 
So if you happen to make your color too dark after you already put the color on the canvas, then you can take like an even lighter version than what you want and start to blend that right on the canvas. And that'll help to bring that color closer to what you'd like to have. Now we're adding the trees right above that section of rock. Again, we have more contrast here, so I'm using a darker base color for these, this part of the tree. Now we're moving back over to the left side of the waterfall, and this section of rock is cooler and a little bit more on the purple-brown side than the right side of the waterfall. So I blended. This color looks a little cooler than what the color looks like in the reference photograph, but we can adjust that later. Uh, this color is a blend of ivory black, titanium white, burnt umber, dioxazine purple. Then you can play around with adding little bits of other colors to warm or cool this down uh, or to build or bring down the vibrancy of the color. Using more of my burnt umber, maybe with a hint of magenta and some white in there for this section of rock that's a little more on the purple side, and then bringing that up, blending it into that cooler color. It's helping things to look a little warmer everywhere. Using a little bit of yellow ochre with white and umber, blending that in, putting some down, and then blending it into the other colors. Again, just trying to get those general sections of highlight and shadow without getting too detailed. Just going back and forth with the brush. Trying not to leave any sections bare as I continue to move from background to foreground, making sure I'm covering all of the empty space on the canvas. It's really important to get the shapes accurate, so there I just made a quick little adjustment to the shape of the waterfall. I made the top of the waterfall just a little too narrow, so I adjusted that. So keep an eye on things as you're working with this base layer of paint to make sure you're getting everything accurate. Make sure the waterfall is not too wide or too tall and that you get that nice V shape of the rocks just above the falls. And you have like that V shape in the valley where these rocks all come down into the river valley slash gorge. Um, and just kind of make sure as you're putting this base layer of paint down that everything is looking accurate from like a shape standpoint. Uh, and like proportions, which the grid method should definitely help you out with that, but it's going to be really important to get everything accurate with this first layer of paint, or you might have to go back and add additional layers of paint to uh, make up for things if, if something starts to look off as you're adding your details in the next part. And looking at the painting now, it almost looks like my falls are slightly too wide, or they aren't angled quite as much to the left as I would like them to be and I can adjust that easily by just building up the shadow a little bit more on the right side. So some things are easy to adjust but big important things in the painting like for example the waterfall is the focus so if something is totally off with the shape of your waterfall or the shape of that V for the rocks that lead down to the waterfall, that's going to be a little bit harder to fix all that and add detail in the next session. So just try to get things as close to the reference photo as you can with this round. I'm continuing to make my way to the foreground with this painting. This little section of rock down here is kind of in the mist 
has more ochre in the color rock down here. So there's more ochre and burnt umber. It's kind of toned down by some ultramarine blue maybe. And I just bring that color all the way down to where my tree line is down here. At this point, I'm starting to jump around a little bit. Uh, technically, I should have gone over to the right side, that rock facing uh, that's farther in the background, but I decided to work on the trees in the foreground. And uh, if you're an experienced painter and you're comfortable doing that, you're welcome to do that too. Uh, but if you don't wanna have any issues with your colors blending uh, with the rock right behind these trees, then maybe wait to put these trees in until the end. I put in a base layer, next I put in a shadow color, and I kind of blend them in together just slightly. The shadow color is more phthalo blue, burnt umber, and sap green, and the highlight color is more sap green with a little bit of cadmium yellow medium, white, maybe a hint of umber or sienna in there too. using pure sap green for some of these trees here. That kind of gives us like a middle tone that's not highlight or shadow. And you can play around by adding hints of alizarin and crimson, more ochre or phthalo green to your sap green to build up the variation in your greens right in this foreground section. That's gonna help to build the depth in your trees. I'm starting to add some of these trees that are moving farther into the background here on the left side of the rocks. And I'm basically just kind of putting the trees in little clusters using my brush, just making up and down motions to add a couple little clusters of trees in there. And then we're going back to adding some color to the actual rock. And we're using a cooler shadow color here. The color in the reference photo is definitely warmer than what I just put down. And that's something we can make up for later as well. But for this shadow color, we're using umber with ultramarine blue, maybe hints of dioxazane purple. Uh, again, some white and black in there too. And we have some really deep shadows where there are trees in the shadows. And that's where we have a little bit of sap green in there, more burnt umber, and probably some dioxazane purple to really make that cool dark shadow for the trees in the shadow lines there and the shadow on the rocks has a lighter value and is warmer in color. So I'm putting all of those shadows in first, everywhere that I see a shadow in the reference photo. And once we get those shadows down, I'll go back in that same section and start to add highlights wherever we have highlights on rocks that don't have color in there yet. 
Here we're adding the highlights to the rock using some burnt sienna, white, yellow ochre, burnt umber, a little bit of dioxazine purple in there too, and then kind of playing around with adding little bits of other colors, uh, maybe some black or some ultramarine blue to tone that down a little. And then once I get those highlight colors in there, I'm using variations. I'm not using that same color for the whole section of highlight part of the rock. I'm using a little bit more white and ochre in some spots and kind of also adjusting my tree line and my little tiny shadows in there too where little sections of shadows are visible and then we're starting to make our way forward closer to the foreground starting to blend in a couple more shadows that we see and tying all of these colors together completely covering up any of that empty space This section of rock in the foreground on the left side has more saturation and I'm starting with more of a highlight color here using some yellow ochre, white, a little bit of cadmium yellow medium, and a little bit of sienna in there too. And then we're going to keep building up the saturation on these rocks in the foreground here. We're going to, we have a couple little uh, scattered trees that cast a shadow behind them then that's mostly going to go in in part two um, basically just focusing on the rock under the trees unless it's an area that's like totally covered in tree I'm gonna just go for that base rock color first and then we'll add the trees after this layer of paint has dried but this rock here even has little uh, like ridges as it's coming down where some sections are a little more burnt sienna and have some more purple in them for the shadows and then some uh, sections are a little bit more illuminated with sunlight and have more cadmium yellow light in them. So just play around with your colors until you get something that looks nice and kind of matches your reference photograph for a base color. <laughs> 
And at this point, you guys kind of... You should have figured out the process by now. It's getting repetitive at this point. We're just kind of continuing to add some colors for the rocks, filling in all that space, seeing where there are shadows on the photo and where to put them in the painting, and then also where to put our sections of highlight. Not getting too detailed yet. Uh, first putting some color down and then going back with the brush and starting to blend in other subtle little colors just so it's kind of like a little mental note for ourselves in part two to build up the shadow there or to add a tree there or something like that. This little ridge is all in shadow here, so I'm just adding my shadow color. We got a little hint of a highlight on this little bit of the ridge there, so I'm adding the highlight, letting it kind of blend into my shadow for now. Trying to get that shape accurate to what I'm seeing in the reference photograph. And now we've made it to this rock right up in front in the foreground. Uh, this rock here, if you if you want, you can work on the two sections of rock and slope behind this rock in the foreground uh, with the tree line and everything, or you could just work on this and then work on the trees next. Just make sure you don't leave any empty space on the canvas. Make sure everything's covered with paint. I saw that there was some lighter gray blue lichen on this rock, so I was using a little bit more of that blue color for in there. The important thing, again, is to just remember where your shadows are and where your highlights are, so I started off more with my shadow colors in the rock. This rock has a lot of color variation on it because there's lichen on the rock, there's a section of rock that's in highlight uh, because the light's hitting, hitting it, and then there's a section of this rock that's in shadow. Uh, so there is a lot going on with this rock right here, but you don't want this to be the focus of your painting. You want the waterfall to be the focus. So when we work on this in part two, we might not go too crazy with detail on this rock just so this rock doesn't become our focal point. 
now we're starting to work on those trees that are behind this rock in the foreground. And these trees have sap green, a little bit of crimson or magenta in there, uh, just to kind of tone down that warmth in the green. And maybe some ochre in there too. Basically going for a base color and then adding some shadows in little sections where we see shadow in the reference photo and then adding a little variation to our green too so it's not just one flat color of green. Using my flat tip brush and continuing to make up and down brush strokes, going around and pushing in those little shadows and other variations of green, just to start to bring things to life a little bit without going too crazy into detail just yet. And finally, we've made our way to the rock on the right side, just behind that rock in the foreground. Going with a base color that's a little on the lighter side. This has some sienna, some umber, white, a little magenta, or a rose color. And then our shadows have a little more umber and ultramarine blue in them. Kind of blending the shadows up into the highlights. Getting a nice soft blend using my little flat tip brush and just finishing off this first round of painting part one by completely covering the canvas with our base layer of paint so right now like I mentioned before the goal of part one was just to get all of our features shapes and colors accurate as if we're looking at the reference photo with fuzzy vision. And then in part two, we'll come back, we'll add highlights, we'll add more shadows, uh, things, yeah, things will get more bright. The focus is gonna keep being on that waterfall and we're gonna add detail to the trees, more lichen on the rocks, build up the shadows and highlights a little more on the rocks and just bring the painting to life. So I hope you guys enjoyed this part one of painting Lower Yellowstone Falls. Make sure you come back next week so you can catch part two of painting Yellowstone Falls where we're going to finish the painting. Have a great day and happy painting everybody. Bye bye.